Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, Zooming from our house. I'm Pastor Jan Osminski. My husband, um, Michael Osminski, will be sharing the sermon um, after communion. Um, and I, and, I, and um, I'm going to be sharing out of Isaiah 44 today. I know that our church has uh, been reading it every week. I'm going backwards a little bit um, because I really felt the Lord answered one of my prayers. And so um, I want to share with you what I really feel the Lord gave me today. So in Isaiah 44, it starts with, Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, in Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, informed you from the womb, who will help you? Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jesurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and floods on the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit on your descendants, and my blessing on your offspring. They will spring up among the grass, like willows by the water courses. And one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's. And name himself by the name of Israel. Well, you know, for a long time I've been um, really asking God, what is it that I can do to change my life, that I can become more like you, Jesus? What is it I can do? And I came across an article by John Piper, who I really enjoy reading. Uh, I really feel like he's a man of integrity and he loves God. And he had an article about the Holy Spirit. So these ideas... Um, I think really a lot of them came from him, so I want to make sure he gets the credit for this. Um, it has to do with hope, hope that leads to joy, that leads to love. You know, he brought up that, why is it on Friday we're so happy and excited, but on Monday we're not the same way? And, and he mentioned that, you know, on Fridays we're so hopeful for a nice weekend. We're hopeful. Maybe we're celebrating something. We're getting together with friends and family. And so we have this hope in our hearts that brings us happiness. And so, um, so and when you think about birthdays and Christmas and vacations, we get hopeful, we get happy. But then many times in those situations, we lose that hope. Because maybe something happened. So that hope that we feel based on something like Christmas or vacation or birthdays does not sustain us. We need something deeper than those things to, to bring us hope. Um, so when we think about Fridays, we are hoping for a brighter future. I know I do. Anybody that works uh, Monday through Friday is probably rejoicing. It's funny because where I work, we're always, we always say, you know, one more day till Friday or two more days till Friday. Or, and we, we really kind of um, laugh about that. And then we're like, oh, I got to go back on Monday. And so we experience this surge of, of a brighter future on our weekends. And um, so that hope brings us to joy. So there's, there's really like steps that go here. We, we first get the hope in our hearts. And then we get the joy that leads to love. It overflows in kindness to others. You know, and, and maybe you've noticed some people are happier on Fridays than they are on Mondays. Maybe that, that joy overflows into love and kindness to other people. So, and, and I can think of some people in our congregation that really live like that. They are so full of hope and joy. It leads to an expression of love to all people. So what stops us, though, from really believing in the good news of Christianity? What stops us? What prevents us from following this track? What, what interferes? Um, we wish our lives were a constant spring of life-giving water, satisfying that the needs of others. But our anxious hearts stop us. When I think of Mother Teresa as an example, 
And, and so many of us will go, like, she was amazing. You know, but yet we're not like her. Why is that? And I think because, um, you know, maybe she was just uh, really sold out. and Maybe we're not. Or uh, I, I don't really know. But I, I know that many times living in America, we let um, things get in our hearts. Anxiety um, about, oh, bills or can I afford this? Or um, what about COVID? Or what about so many things just plug up that natural flow of hope to joy to love. In Romans uh, 5, 3 to 5, it says, um, I'm going to start with one. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Hope. We need hope desperately. Um, John Piper said this, and I'm going to quote this. He said, just like water is made for the gills of a fish, and the wind is made for the wings of a bird. So the gospel of Christ is made for the soul of man. It gives the full assurance of hope. And from that, the fullness of joy. And from that, the freedom to love. So we see a definite pattern here. So now the bigger question is, how do we do this? How do we get this? Um... Well, first of all, reading the Word, it was divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Divinely inspired. So it is holy. It is the Word of God. So when you read the Word, what's happening is you are becoming drenched in the Holy Spirit. Let's look at line. It says here, um, um, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty. See, when you're really thirsty for God, and you're reading the word of God, the Holy Spirit descends on you, and you are drenched, drenched, not just a little drizzle or a little mist. You are drenched in the power of the Holy Spirit, drenched. And you know, if you have a cup and you put it outside in a down downpour, that cup's going to fill and overflow. And that's what we want in our lives. We don't want to be a sponge. We want to be a spring. We want to be the person where people can come to and quench their thirst, get their thirst met. And he says, and floods on the dry ground. So if you picture that cup, I'm reading the word, I'm praying. I'm really, really reading the word. And I don't mean, it hit me today, we can take out the Bible, read a Psalms and close it. That's not reading the word need to digest it. You need to interpret it. You need to saturate your soul with it. Maybe it's just a couple lines. Read it over and over and maybe do some investigating. What did the Lord mean there? You can do that. And it's very easy nowadays. Just go on Google. Google, what does this mean in the Bible? You need to saturate your very soul with the word of God. See, if we're not equipped in this hour, we're going to just be knocked off. Seriously. And I see, and this is just my own opinion, that the line in the sand has been really drawn and it is becoming more and more apparent those that are with Christ and those that aren't. And so you need to ask yourself, well, which side am I on? And if I want to be on the side of Christ, what do I need to do? Here's a good example. Reading the word and let yourself be drenched in that word and drenched in the power of the Holy Spirit. So out of that will come hope, hope, hope. And as that hope overflows, then joy is going to spring forth. It's going to spring forth and you can't plug it up. You can't stop it. It's just going to be going. So. And again, we know the joy, you can't cap a joyful person. You can't. And, and, and their joy leads to others wanting what they have. And it produces love in other people. So 
what does an outpouring of the Spirit accomplish? So you may sing that. I don't know. You haven't really sold me on this. Well, it takes away your fears. When you are so entrenched in the Holy Spirit, when you're so entrenched in the Word of God, when you are soaked, soaked, your fears are taken away. You know you're in a different place. And you know you're able to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Um, your longing for God is satisfied. You just feel different. You're not satisfied by things or people or places. You're satisfied by God. And it changes you. It just changes you. And, you know, many times we we think that, and, and tell me, you know, you can just ask yourself, is this you? We get in these funks where we think misery is coming. It's coming. I know it's coming. I'm just waiting for it. It's going to knock on my door. It's going to walk in. It's going to sit down next to me. Misery is coming. Or sometimes we think happiness is never coming. My life is just, uh, it is. It's, it's, it's miserable. It's horrible. It, it's just the way it is. But see, when you, when you let God pour over you, and you become so saturated. It says, look, you become, you, you will be like um, willows by the water courses. You know, it's not just a one-time deal. You will be a place like a tree planted by the waters. You will be there, saturated, constantly roots, constantly in the Holy Spirit, constantly in water. You know, we're seeing this time of year so much life coming forth bugs on the trees, flowers breaking through the ground. And it to me is such a sign of Jesus, of that he brings life to us all the time. So we will overflow in love. We will be springs, not sponges. Our goal is to spill over to love others. That's our goal. John Piper also said, but the spirit through the word the Spirit through the Word, and the Word by the Spirit takes away fear, nourishes hope, fills with joy, overflows in love, and glorifies God. I'm going to read that again because I think that sums it all up. But the Spirit through the Word, I have to be reading the Word. I can't just read words. I have to read the Word of God. And the word by the Spirit takes away fear, nourishes hope, feeds hope in me, fills me with joy, overflows in love, and most importantly, glorifies God. So let's close with Romans 15, verse 13. You know, this book is just loaded with hope scriptures. You could you could just spend your whole afternoon today just looking at hope scriptures. Romans is loaded with them. Uh, 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of hope fill you with all hope. I'm sorry, with all joy in peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are people in our congregation, honestly, they do this. They are springs of living water for the lost. They minister out of a deep, deep spring that you can't cork. And I'm amazed and, and so happy that there are people doing that you know it it doesn't take you don't have to be a mother Teresa you don't have to be ministering to the lepers in India you can do your work here there's a lot of work that needs to be done but we need to trust God we need to open our hearts and we need to believe him and not believe the other voice not believe the other the other um, pullings in our lives we need to really 
uh, protect our hearts, protect our minds, protect our souls with the word of God. Now, uh, this message is for me because I have been searching, searching, searching for answers. How was it that Jesus did what he did so naturally? You know, Jesus knew the word of God. He knew it. He studied it as a young boy. And we see the evidence in the when he went to the synagogue when he was 12. And everything he did came out of the knowledge of his father and the word of God. And just by watching him, it should lead us to the path that we need to go. So this is the time where we have communion. This is also, I just, I know I forget. I just want to know that we do have online Sunday school. And um, Jackie Hicks calls it Sunny School. And probably Loretta does too. You're welcome to join. Um, uh, some people are already registered and they're on. If you're not, you're welcome to go to www.lhfc. LHCF. Warren.com. Uh, and I see that Andrea has it on there for you right on the screen. So please bring it, you know, let your children put it on another room and, and they will they will be so blessed. You know, scriptures say that we are to feed our offspring so that they grow too. So they grow like the watercress by the by the water's edge there. We want our children to grow in this hour. We want them to be filled with the goodness of our God. So Lord, at this time, we, we want to thank you abundantly for ministering to us. Lord, you know what? I don't know how you can take us some days. I don't know how you are so patient with us because we, we just make such ridiculous decisions. We look for other answers in other places other than going directly to you. Lord, forgive us for our unfaithfulness. But in this hour, dear God, may as we look upon the cross, how you suffered, may it give us hope, Lord. May it give us joy, Lord. And may it give us love for all mankind. So, Lord, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for your life. In Jesus' name, amen. And we thank you for the blood. And we thank you for all that you did for us from the very beginning. When you and the Father and the Holy Spirit decided that you wanted to share your hope, joy, and love with humanity, and you knew when you did that what it would mean, we thank you, Lord, for your unfailing love, for your unfailing hope and your unfailing joy and your unfailing love for us. Thank you, dear God. I pray that we would become just like you. Lord, we would just become like you in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope this made sense to you. I felt like it opened, unlocked a door for me. It just broke it down very simply. Hope, joy, and love. And we want to be springs, not sponges. Remember that. Write that down. We want to be springs. We want to be overflowing. We want people to see in us something that they want. Desperately, They don't want them to see people despairing and people downtrodden. They want to see joy and hope and love. So go in peace today. Enjoy the word that's going to be um, shared. It hasn't prepared a long time. He prepares, and I just want you to know, speaking of studying the word, I don't know how many hours a day he reads the word. I really don't. I've never timed him, but I know it's many hours a day. In fact, on Wednesday for the Bible study, he said, I, I've got to prepare some more. And I said, some more? I said, you've been studying for hours. He said, but I really feel like I have to know it. And that really said something to me. He's hungry for the word of God. He's hungry. He, 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 there's no satisfying him. And, and honestly, in this hour, this is when I'm, and, and I know this might hurt some people's feelings, but people that are really hungry for God, are on Sundays. They either go to the women's Bible study on Wednesdays or the Wednesday night Bible study in our church, or they go to the Thursday morning with John. We have a corporate prayer time. You know, I I just feel like in this time of COVID, when so many of us are really stuck at home, 
we should be taking advantage of the online um, studies and s Sunday meetings. And I just feel like a lot of us don't even do that. We can't even turn on our, our, our Facebook and watch or YouTube. I mean, how easy. You don't have to get in your car. You don't even have to get dressed. You can wear your pajamas and drink your coffee. You know, and I have to be honest with you, that is disappointing to me. I would expect that more people would be searching for the Word of God. So that's my two cents. So anyway, have a blessed day and enjoy the Word, and may it minister to your soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Last week, we talked about the prophetic significance of the resurrection, and we used Colossians chapter 1. And I'm going to continue in Colossians chapter 1 today. We um, looked at Colossians 1. Uh, let me, oh, I finally have a spot here. My dog has exited. We looked at Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 23 last week. And I want to add verses 24 through 29 as well. We're going to Look at Colossians 1 again. The first 23 verses, Paul is addressing the church. He's speaking to the church. Uh, in verses 24 through 29, he's speaking about himself, his apostolic ministry. Uh, I want to, um, we're going to summarize those first 23 verses really to look at connections uh, in the text with ideas and concepts that Paul is trying to tie together to encourage the Colossians. And then we're going to look at Paul's apostolic imperative in verses 24 through 29. Now, I, uh, we got the term the apostolic imperative uh, a number of years ago from Brother Carlton Kenny. Uh, just what a rich teacher. He's gone home to be with the Lord, but just a tremendous teacher in the Lord, really taught apostolically. And uh, um, that phrase, the apostolic imperative, uh, has really stuck with me because it, it speaks of this, this impulse, this urging, this, this, this divine motivation in Paul to fulfill his apostolic mandate to the church. So, with that in mind, let's go back to uh, Colossians 1, verse 1. <clears throat> now, Paul starts out with the greeting, the first two verses, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is going to define his apostolic ministry by using different images. And the first image that Paul speaks of, he refers to himself as an apostle. And he includes Timothy as part of his apostolic team. He actually lists uh, other members of the apostolic team uh, in chapter 4. Uh, this is the apostolic team, including Epaphras, uh, who he mentions in verse 7, who were part of the founding of the church in Colossae. And so he, he greets uh, as a member of an apostolic team. The interesting thing is Paul sees himself as a member of the apostolic team, but he himself did not plant the church in Colossae personally. He he had oversight of the apostolic team that planted the church, but he still considers the vision and the mission that he received from the Lord, whether he is involved personally or his apostolic team is involved personally, it's all part of the same mission and the same vision. So that Paul could say, when I send Timothy, when I send Epaphras, when I send Tychicus, they are moving in my mission and my vision, which is not my mission and my vision. It's the mission and the vision that the Lord Jesus himself gave to me. 
And that's really important to understand when we talk about doing church. That a church has a mission and a vision, and everybody in that congregation who's really a functioning member of that church, not just a, a participating member of the church. In other words, I go to church. Uh, it's a functioning member of the church is involved in the mission and the vision that that church has been raised up by the Lord to carry out. Church, going to church, we're using modern terminology, going to church is not about going somewhere and having your needs met about going somewhere and you personally being served. Going to church is being part of a mission and a vision, an apostolic or prophetic or pastoral or evangelistic mission. And we go to church to be equipped for that mission. Now, Paul in terms addresses uh, the epistle here, to the saints and the faithful brethren who are in Christ. And remember, we talked last week, there's going to be a series of phrases of of in Christ that really uh, dominate this letter. Uh, This first chapter is all about being in Christ and how that is the dimension and the domain that equips us to carry out the mission and the vision. He calls them uh, saints, and faithful brethren. Uh, that's uh, chesed and amit from the Old Testament. That's, that's the saints were the, the ones that were uh, immersed in the Lord's steadfast love. That's what a saint is. And the faithful are those who are immersed in the Lord's truth. It's his steadfast love and his truth, or in New Testament terminology, grace and truth, which we're going to see in this passage. That's what equips the church to be the church. That's what going to church is really about. And he addresses the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. That's the domain in which the steadfast love and the faithfulness of the Lord, the grace and the truth function in order to equip us for the work of the Lord. Now, saints, actually, there, there, there are two background terms that are used in the Old Testament to give us our New Testament term of saint. One is uh, the, the, the Hasidim, and the, uh, the other term are those who are Kodesh, those who are Chesed in the Lord and those who are Kodesh. Those who are holy, the saints are the holy ones, set apart in Christ, set apart in God set apart in covenant relationship with the Lord. And the other word, of course, we've already mentioned, it's chesed, it's his steadfast love. It's those who are immersed in his steadfast love, become transformed by that steadfast love and embrace that steadfast love for all aspects of life. We receive that in the New Testament in Christ. Grace to you and peace, not yet grace and truth, but grace and peace, which again would be steadfast love and shalom. It's, it's steadfast love, God's faithfulness and commitment to his people, and peace is his shalom, his desire to give us all equal access to all blessings, heavenly blessings, blessings of his creational purposes, b- blessings in Christ in the heavenly places, grace and peace, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything starts with the Father, moves uh, in the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this is where Paul begins to address the brethren. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, always praying for you. So now this is, Paul begins with a picture of apostolic behavior toward the church. Brethren, if we're leaders, I'm speaking to my leadership team right now. If we are leaders in the body of Christ, we start in thanksgiving to the Father. We, we, we must always begin with a thankful attitude. Now, the Greek word for thankful is from um, ukarizomai. Karizomai is to receive a free gift, and the word u is a good free gift. 
So, so we're, we're thankful to the Lord because he has given us good free gifts. The, the word charizomai not only means to be given a free gift, but it also means to be forgiven of one's debts, a cancellation of one's debts. It is, it is a giving of an inheritance from the Lord. The land belongs to the Lord in the Old Testament, and he shares it with his people. It means freedom from slavery. So thanksgiving always begins with what God the Father has done for us in Christ. So the thanksgiving is to the Father and to the Son. And Paul says, I, I begin my whole perspective of ministry as an apostle, as a leader, out of a spirit of thanksgiving. And number two, I pray for you always. Apostolic ministry begins in prayer. It will, it will include some other things, but it begins in prayer. He says, when we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, faith is in Christ, and the love which you have toward all the saints, love is, is at this point ministered to the brothers and sisters in Christ. Faith is in Christ. Love is to the saints. And verse 8 says that Epiphas has told um, Paul he's declared to the apostolic team your love in the Spirit. So faith is in Christ. We, we talked about last week, we've got to always reemphasize this image. Being in Christ is like there's a circle. That circle is a domain. That circle is a reality. That circle is an atmosphere. That circle is heaven coming to earth. And when we express our faith in Christ, we step inside the circle where he is. And then where he is, we are also. And everything that belongs to him belongs to us. Now, to, when we talk about, well, what's in that circle? What's in Christ? Well, the Holy Spirit is in Christ. And the Holy Spirit ministers the love of God to us and then through us. So Paul gives thanks and, and, and his prayer is based on this testimony that the Colossians have faith in Christ and love toward all the saints. And then verse 5 says that this faith and this love is um, because of what Pastor Jan was sharing this morning, because of hope. It's on account of hope. It finds its source in hope. It begins in hope. Its foundation is in hope. And this is why the message of hope that Pastor Jan was sharing, that John Piper was sharing, that we're talking about here, that Paul is sharing in Colossians 1. Hope is the ground. It's the source. It's the origin of our faith and our love. We must have hope. And as we define it last week, we're going to define it again this week. Hope is has to do with the promises of God in the gospel. This is what hope is. Hope says, I read the gospel, and in the gospel, God has said he has done many things for us, he is doing many things for us, and he will do many things for us. It's a promise of new heavens and the new earth taking a, a place in human creation as creation is moved toward God's purposes for human history. It's the promises of joy. It's the promises of peace. It's the promises of healing. It's the promises of restoration. It's the promises of reconciliation. It's the promises of life triumphing over death. This is all the gospel. Gospel is simply the good news. If Thanksgiving is, is the good gift, the good gift is the gospel, and the gospel is the good news, and it's the gospel that causes us to rejoice in Christ. Now, when we read Scripture, let's just talk about New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, hope in the gospel is that everything God has said is true is true. Everything that God has promised will come to pass. 
and history is now because of Christ moving toward the ultimate end when the Lord's kingdom purposes are established in the earth and Jesus is declared King of kings and Lord of lords and as a King of kings and Lord of lords, he promises to bring shalom to God's entire creation. That's hope. Hope is simply when I read scripture, I begin to live as if it's true because I know the one who's promised is faithful and he'll bring it to pass. And see, that is why hope creates faith and hope creates love. Now, it says that this hope is reserved in heaven. This hope is stored in heaven. It's it's something that's in heaven. It's not in you. It's not in me. It's not on the earth. It's not anywhere where the devil or man or creation can destroy it or take it from us because it's in heaven. And Jesus is in heaven. And heaven is in Jesus. When we step inside the circle in Christ, This hope that is reserved for us in heaven is ours because it's not just that Jesus is in heaven. Heaven is in Jesus. And Jesus brought heaven down to earth. The fact that it's stored in heaven is a, it speaks of its its enduring factor, its safety, its, its removal from the ability of anything that opposes God to stop those things from coming to pass. I've heard of your faith in Christ, the love which you have toward all the saints because the Spirit is at work within us and because the hope that is stored up for us in heaven of which you heard beforehand, he's saying, I'm not telling it to you now, I'm writing to you because you already heard it. You heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you just as it also has in all the world and is bearing fruit and growing. It doesn't say we bear fruit and we grow. It says the gospel bears fruit and the gospel grows. And when we step into Christ, the gospel bears fruit in us. The gospel grows in us. Bearing fruit means it produces things consistent with who we are in Christ so that now we can go out and be witnesses to Christ for those who don't know Christ. That's what bearing fruit is. It also, it bears the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Our lives and our character gets conformed to Christ. We don't just speak Christ's words, we look like Christ. And the gospel grows inside us. See, the gospel is a seed planted in the soil of our hearts and it grows 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. You know, you are not called to grow in the Lord. You are called to have faith and hope in the Lord that the gospel planted inside of you will grow. Let it grow. Let it increase, is what Paul is saying. And he calls it the word of truth. And then he continues. He says, it, is, it has come to you just as it has in all the world. It's bearing fruit and growing just as also among you from the day in which you heard it and fully knew the grace of God and truth. We said we'd go from from steadfast love and faithfulness to grace and truth. Here we are. We're at grace and truth. And see, it is knowing the grace of God and truth, knowing that everything begins with God's grace. It doesn't begin with me. It doesn't begin with my righteousness, my resolve, my strength. It doesn't even begin with my faith. It begins with his grace. His grace transmits the gospel in seed form into my heart and that truth begins to grow and expand in us. Much of what the church has to come to right now, see, the church has lived for so long in its own strength, in its own power. It's, it's lived a, a, a works righteousness. He, the righteousness uh, of human beings. Boy, I got I to gotta get all this strength together inside of me and just really put my uh, uh, nose to the grindstone and live a life for Christ. The church has lived so long in that kind of false reality 
In other words, it, it, it doesn't understand grace. And, and actually, it says here, we have to understand grace. We need a revelation of grace. The Greek says, from the day in which you heard and got this explosive revelation of the grace of God in truth. That's what truth is. Truth is, is when we begin to understand that God's grace is the, is the power and the strength that moves us into the purposes of God. We need a revelation of grace. So finally, it's like the Lord up in heaven says, well, they're trying so hard with their own strength. It's not working. I'm going to send them COVID. I'm going to send them civil disruption. I'm going to send them uh, political division. I'm going to send them things that are so beyond their ability to perform on a human level that they're going to have to say, I don't know what to do. Ah, Eureka, trust in his grace. Turn away from attempting to do this in your own strength, in your own righteousness, in your own goodness, and step into the circle that is known as in Christ, and everything that belongs to him will be yours. Faith, hope, love, the spirit, truth, power. We'll see that continuing. So, he says, you, you had this full revelation of the grace of God in truth, and that corresponds to the word of truth of the gospel in verse 5. And Paul continues, just as also you learn from Epaphras, our beloved bondservant, our beloved fellow bondservant, our beloved co-bondservant, who is faithful for you and a servant of Christ. Now, Epaphras apparently was the apostolic team lead that planted this church. And he's, report, he's reporting back to Paul and said, the, the, the seed of the gospel was sown. God's grace was revealed in truth. And the vision was imparted and the mission has now taken root in Colossae. And now Colossae, who received the gospel, will now be carriers of the gospel through the earth. Epaphras reported that. And then Paul describes Epaphras. Now remember, we've said Paul is using terminology to describe his own ministry. In verse 1, he calls himself an apostle. The one sent on a mission by the Lord. The sent one. The missionary. He is an apostle of Jesus, and it's through the will of God. And, and we're going to see the will of God that establishes Paul as an apostle and moves through him, then begins to form the will of God in those churches that he raises up and those individual members who are being discipled. The will of God is a driving force. But now Paul calls himself an apostle. Now there, there are two words for servant that are used to describe Epaphras here in verse 7. One is a bond servant, and the other is a ministering servant. See, a servant is a servant. A servant is not the master. A servant does the master's bidding. But where a servant begins to be a servant is when he sees himself as a bond servant. He is bound in his heart and in his mind and in his soul to his master which means what his master wants, he wants. What his master tells him to do, he does. What his master desires, he desires. The first dimension of a servant is literally we are in bondage to Jesus. See, this is a real interesting thing. America is all about personal freedom, individual freedom. And, and again, it, to truly disciple a person, into the purposes of the Lord, that person must come into bondage to Jesus. Now see, we were in bondage to the world. We were in bondage to sin. We were in bondage to death. We were in bondage to demonic powers. Jesus comes and sets us free, and now I don't want to be in bondage to anything or anyone anymore. But see, that's where America gets in the middle of Bible. See, America's all about personal freedoms. You can't tell me anything. But you see, that's, that's not Bible. 
Bible says you're going to be in bondage to somebody or somebody else. You're going to be in bondage to someone. As Bob Dylan said in his song many years ago, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you are going to have to serve somebody. And see, Christians, American Christians, chafe against bondage. But my job as a discipler is to put you in the bondage, but it's to put you in bondage to Jesus. And the bondage to Jesus is similar to the bondage that a man and a woman enter into in marriage. See, see, when before you're married, you're, you're not in bondage to any human being. The moment you get married, you trade your individual freedom and you say to the person with whom you are entering into a covenant relationship, you and I are bound together. It's called the bond of the covenant, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament writings. And, 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 and look at this. Look at the failure of marriage in America. Look at the failure in the church concerning marriages. Mar marriages have as high of a divorce rate in the church as they do outside of the church. See, that's America getting in the middle of our lack of understanding that we are to be the bond servant of Christ. I'm in bondage to Jesus, which means he can tell me where to go, what to do, when to sit down, when to stand up, when to eat, when not to eat, when to sleep, when to go here, when to not go here, when to speak, when not to speak. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. The picture where America gets in is everything's about freedom now. I need to be affirmed because I have rights as an individual. Well, we, all, we have some rights. That's, that's what freedom is about. We have the freedom and the right to become everything the Lord has desired us to become, and we become that by being in bondage to Jesus. So Christians who chafe when implications of discipleship are brought forth, and a leader says, you can't do that. You can do that. And that leader is speaking for Jesus. It's, it's, just, it's just this desire to cast off all restraints. See, America goes too far with freedom. It, it has idolatrized individual human rights. It has, it has made an idol out of freedom. For freedom, Christ has made you free, Scripture says. And what's the freedom Christ has made us free for? We're free from the powers of darkness and sin and death and the demonic. And we're now connected in covenant with Jesus. Now, Paul calls Epaphras a fellow bondservant. It means he's calling himself. He's saying, Epaphras, who's a, a, a bondservant of the Lord, and he and I together are bondservants in the Lord. So that's the first view of a bondservant. In bondage to the master. In other words, you have my heart, Lord. You have my heart. You have my heart. Wherever you go, I'll follow. I'll follow you when it's pleasant. I'll follow you when it's not pleasant. I'll follow you when it's good for me, and I'll follow you when it's not good for me. I'll follow you when I understand, and I'll follow you when I don't understand. Secondly, he calls him, he is faithful for you as a ministering servant of Christ. The second aspect of uh, um, uh, servanthood is a servant is there to minister to others, to minister to God and to minister to others. So he says, and he said, uh, we, this is what we learned from Epaphras. He told us of your love in the Spirit. He declared to us. He, he declared, he made visible to us. He, he made us aware of the fact that you so are walking in the love of the Spirit. So this church was walking in hope and this church was walking in love. Now I want you to see this progress of hope. Hope, according to verse 5, is the hope laid up for us in heaven. It's the hope of the gospel. When we drop down to verse 23, verse 23 talks about that we need to continue in the faith 
founded and firm and not drift away from the hope of the gospel. You see kind of hope and love working here together in these first eight verses. You see hope and faith working together here. We continue in faith on a firm foundation, on a solid foundation, and we are never going to be shifted away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a ministering servant. The the hope of the gospel, it causes us to lay a firm foundation of faith in our lives because hope is living as if what the Bible says is true. When we live as if the Bible as if what the Bible has said is true, we do what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Those who hear my word and do it, they hear it in hope. It creates faith in them. They do it. Those who hear my word and do it, I will liken them to those who built their house on what? A rock, a solid foundation. And when the floods come, the house is not moved because the house is built on a firm foundation. You understand the firm foundation is faith. And that firm foundation is hearing the word of God and doing it. Hearing the word of God and acting as if it's true. And of course, I mentioned this last week, and not be shifted from the hope of the gospel. To shift means to, to uh, it's, it's a word that when earthquake, an earthquake comes and the ground shifts, and remember Colossae was a city in the Lyca Valley, and that valley um, was subject to many earthquakes. Paul's using a, an image that they would understand. And then Paul calls himself a servant, a servant of the hope of the gospel. And he uses the same term then that he uses to describe Epaphras. So Paul now sees himself as an apostle. He characterizes himself as a bond servant. He's completely joined in one heart to the Lord, and he is a ministering servant. He's not there to have his needs met, but he's here to meet the needs of others. Jesus said in Mark, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's the giving of our lives, the laying down of our lives. That's the real impulse behind ministry. Ministers are not CEOs. Ministers are not presidents. Ministers are not rulers that that have people do things for them. Ministers are servants. The greatest authority comes from those who serve. Their hearts are bound to Jesus' heart and they minister to others by laying down their life to what? Sow the hope of the gospel into their lives. Back to verse 9, and then Paul says, I'm looking at some different translations here. i got to go to my uh, second set of notes here. Paul says, For this reason also we, verse 9, chapter 1, from the day in which we heard, have not ceased praying for you and asking God, that you may be filled with the revelation knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding in order that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. So Paul, now he's going back to the report from Epaphras. I've heard, I've heard of, of your conversion to the gospel. You're, you're having the, the mission and the vision, the apostolic mission and vision sown in your midst, and I do not cease praying for you. I'm always praying for you. I don't cease praying for you. Paul has mentioned twice, apostolic ministry, leadership, church leaders. You are called to pray and pray and pray some more for the people of God. I don't see his praying for you. And here's what I'm, I'm praying and asking the Lord for you, that you may be filled. And this issue of filling, we're going to see it in these next few verses. That you may be filled with full revelation of his will. Paul is an apostle by what? Verse 1, the will of God. 
He's an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And he is asking them, he's he's asking the Lord that they would be filled with the revelation of the will of the Father. Just as Paul is motivated by the will, shaped by the will, empowered by the will of God, he's asking that the saints in Colossae will be filled with this revelation of the will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Supernatural revelation. It's, uh, it's spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now keep in mind, for the sake of the argument, understanding is prophetic, wisdom is apostolic. Knowledge, revelation, knowledge, that, that, that's teaching and, and pastoring. Understanding is when we know why. God moves. Understanding is prophetic. It's it's an unveiling and a revelation of God's will and God's purposes. But the apostolic dimension is this dimension that empowers the church to take the prophetically understood will of the Lord and put it into practice. So Paul is praying for an apostolic impartation for the church, not just a prophetic impartation. We, we have a lot of prophetic impartation and revelation in the body of Christ. We need apostolic impartation to go forth, to take that prophetic understanding and prophetic revelation and implement it, make it real, impart it, form it in the lives of God's people. But he's praying for this revelation of wisdom and spiritual understanding. And he's praying for it so that they should walk worthy of the Lord. To walk means to live. They should walk worthy of the Lord. And to be worthy of the Lord is to live up to their status of sainthood. They are saints. They're the chesed ones. They're the holy ones. They are to be immersed in grace and truth. And then that is to form a lifestyle that they are to live out. And how do we walk worthy of the Lord? Or what's, a, what's a, 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 an image of walking worthy in the Lord? He continues, so that you may please him in all respects, in every good work. Pleasing God is a sign that the will of God is at work in our lives. And the will of God, when it's at work in our lives, it makes us worthy Worthy simply means we fulfill our destiny in Christ. And it's, it's about works. It's about a lifestyle. And then those, those works, those worthy works of the Lord that please him in every way are defined now by four things. This is what it means to walk worthy in the Lord. And this is what the revelation in wisdom and understanding of God's will will produce within us. First of all, we, what we do is, first of all, we bear fruit in every good work. We are bearing fruit in good work. That's walking worthy of the Lord. Second, we are growing in the revelation knowledge of God. We're growing in our understanding of who he is. We're bearing fruit. We're bearing fruit in every good work that can be winning people to Christ, that can be discipling others, that can be living out the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We're bearing fruit, but we're also growing in our understanding of who the Lord is. Third, we are being empowered with all power according to his glorious might. The third thing is power. So we have we have bearing fruit, growing in revelation, knowledge of who the Lord is, we have an empowerment, a divine empowerment, which is according to his powerful glory. See, it's this revelation of the glory of the Lord, and in in the Old Testament, the glory of the Lord, two domains. It's seeing the Lord for who he is, and it's understanding the Torah, understanding his word, understanding his covenant, understanding his laws. 
Pastor Jan, when she's talking about reading the word, she's talking that there's a glory in knowing who the Lord is and there's a glory in the word. And we need to discover that glory on those two levels in order to be empowered. And the, uh, this, this power in particular is described, this power works toward all perseverance and long-suffering with joy. And joy is the key because remember, kara, the Greek word for joy, comes from charis, the Greek word for grace. And eucharisto, eucharizo, my thanksgiving, is because God's grace increases joy in us. And when God's grace increases joy within us, we are given perseverance and long-suffering. Perseverance means we press through all obstacles, and long-suffering means suffering is part of God's plan for Christians. It's how he works out his kingdom in human history. Suffering is part of it. And that joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and it is his joy that turns our mourning into dancing. So we press through the obstacles, and we press through suffering, which is our lot in life. In a fallen world, there's suffering, brethren. We, we live in a fallen world until Jesus comes and recreates the entire creation and the new heavens and the new earth, which has been sown in seed form in our earth, in our human experience, in our human existence, in our human history. The kingdom has be, been sown like a seed and it it's just continues to grow. But when it is fully and completely established, sorrow and suffering and tears will all be washed away, wiped away. The former things will exist no longer. But in the meantime, the joy of the Lord is what empowers us to persevere and to walk in long suffering. And the fourth thing is what Paul has already said. Paul said, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 3. And the fourth aspect... Of, of pleasing him and walking in a manner worthy of him is that we give thanks to the Father. Now, he's already talked about he gives thanks to the Father in verse 3. He talks here about the Father is the one to whom we give thanks. See, we give thanks not just to this amorphous figure known as God who's out there somewhere. Our God has been revealed to us as Father. It's Father, it's Son, it's Spirit, the triune God. Even beyond Yahweh in the Old Testament, which was this powerful manifestation of the Lord, even uh, qualifying what Yah, the hidden name of the Lord, meant is the word Father. As I said last week, God is not referred to as Father very often in the Old Testament. It explodes in the New. It's Father. The Father is is the one that causes us to give thanks because he is our father. He's not just our God to us. He's not even simply this supernatural being who's in a covenant, intimate relationship with us. He's father. And father births thanks within us. So to walk worthy in the Lord, we bear fruit. We grow in the revelation knowledge of God. We are empowered to press through everything we need to press through, and we give thanks to the Father. Notice, we grow in the knowledge of God, we give thanks to the Father. What does it mean to grow in the knowledge of God? To see him as Father. We give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. We're back to the saints, all right? The saints from the, uh, the greeting. We are the ones immersed in his steadfast love. He's the one who's qualified us. We don't qualify ourselves. And what it means to be qualified is God enables us. He enables us to share, to have our portion and our allotment in the inheritance of the saints in light. It's in Christ. It's in the word of the gospel. It's in light. When we step into Christ, we receive everything that he has. He's the son. He's the son of God's love. He's the beloved son. We are 
beloved sons and daughters because we're in Christ. He has the inheritance. He's walking in light. He knows the Father as Father. And so we come into light when we are in Christ, when we are in the Word, we're stepping into the circle, and we receive our inheritance. And remember, receiving our inheritance, you receive your portion, your ministry, your destiny, your purpose. That's your inheritance. Debt is canceled. Sins are forgiven, brethren. Your debts are canceled. The debts you have with God are canceled. And third, you're set free from slavery. You're made a free man, a son. Not a slave any longer, but a son. A slave in terms of our relationship to God, but we're free from the enslavement of the earth. Now, verse 13, who, and this who is the Father who's qualified us to share in our inheritance in light. He, the Father, rescued us from the authority or the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now notice, He transferred us from one kingdom to the other. There's not just one circle called in Christ. There's another circle. And you know what that other circle is? And that's the circle of our pre-Christ, before Christ existence, in sin, in death, in darkness, in the world. And he transfers us out of one circle into the other. Now we can still go back and forth between the circles. That's the paradox of life. If I'm in Christ, Lord, why does this, that, and the other thing happen to me? Well, because you step, we step out of the circle in unbelief. We step, step out of the circle in ignorance. We step out of the circle because we're human beings. And, but we have to understand the Father has transferred us into this kingdom of the Son upon whom he has set his love. And so this love of God toward the saints this love of God that the Spirit imparts to us is the love that the Father has for us. He looks at Jesus, his Son, and says, I love my Son, and I love all those who are in Christ with him. In him, here's this, in Christ, this Son of his love, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption means a person who sold themselves into slavery to pay a debt, You had debt slavery primarily in Old Covenant terms. A person who had sold themselves into debt or had sold a portion of their land away to pay for a debt, the Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer would come and that kinsman Redeemer would pay the ransom price and say, I want his freedom back. I want his property back. That's what redemption is. And then we said last week, when we get to verse uh, 15, what we have here is we have a a hymn, a beginning hymn. And uh, Paul fills in some details in the beginning hymn, but here's the hymn. The hymn runs from uh, verses 15 through 18. Verse 15 says, He, it now it begins to talk about all these aspects of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. Verse 17, He is before all things. In Him all things are held together. Verse 18, He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. That's a hymn. That was a song of worship. And they would sing it. He is the invisible image of the invisible God. He's before all things. In him all things are held together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning. And then Paul fills in some theological details in the middle of the hymn to, to um, uh, express the significance of that hymn. But it's, it's incredible. It's all about Christ. From this point on, it's all about Christ. It's been about the church, but it's all about Christ. And the middle stanza of the hymn, it's a, it's a one, two, let's see, one, two, three, four. It's a five stanza hymn. The middle stanza is the ultimate purpose for which the hymn was being made. We said last week it's in verse 17. In him all things are held together. See this, Paul wants to get the church in Christ. And here's what he's saying, verse 15. He's the image of the invisible God. 
He's the firstborn of all creation. All creation came through him. And the firstborn, remember, is the one who gets the double portion of the inheritance to to take care of the father and the mother's needs. You know, you had three sons. You divided the inheritance four ways. Each son gets an equal portion for himself. And then that fourth portion is given to the firstborn son to care for the father and the mother in their old age. Well, we know who the father is. God the Father, and we know who our mother is, the church. And see, Jesus is given the double portion inheritance, so the Father's will will be manifested in the earth, and the Lord will care for the church to bring the church into the fulfillment of those purposes. He's the image of the invisible God, which means he's the visible, seen reality of the the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation because here we go, watch these, watch these words. In him were created all things. The things in heaven, the things on earth, the visible and then the invisible things. In him is creation. The first creation of Genesis 1, the new creation of the church. And notice everything is created in him, including thrones, dominions, powers and principalities. Every aspect of authority was created by him. Thrones speak of places of authority. Dominions speak of manifestations of authority. Powers and principalities. Rulers, leaders who embody and carry out and have power to manifest that authority. That's all in Christ. That means there's no power in the earth. Not China, not Russia, not ISIS, not evil not demonic, no political power, no power in the demonic realm, not life, not death. None of that has authority over Jesus. Jesus has authority over it. And he is before all things in terms of time and in terms of authority. He's before all things and in him all things are held together. Now see, that's that's part of what we need to understand for the church. Everything is held together in Christ. Faith, hope, and love. I talked about it last week in, in verses, uh, uh, verses four and five. You have faith churches that walk in power. You have love churches that walk in good works of, of kindness and justice toward others. And you have hope churches who are really in the truth and understand the truth. And we need those things to be held together in Christ. The church shouldn't be arguing. The faith brothers shouldn't be arguing with the love brothers who argue with the hope brothers and the hope brothers uh, argue with everybody. Everything needs to be held together in Christ. We have to come to a place where we give up this American, westernized individualism and the church starts coming together as the church. Every tribe, every tongue, every racial group, every tradition, every Every nation, believers need to come together in Christ because his job is to hold everything together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in all things he might have the first place, he might have preeminence. When Jesus has the first place, there will be unity. God's purposes will take place in history. Now, here we go, because in him, all fullness was pleased to dwell. Colossians 2.9 says he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him, all fullness dwells. So not only in Christ. Do you understand that we're not only in Christ? Heaven's in Christ. Light is in Christ. Life is in Christ. Grace is in Christ. Redemption's in Christ. Do you understand the Father and the Spirit are in Christ? Everything's in Christ. And Christ is in the Father and the Spirit and the Spirit is in the Father and the Son. It's in Christ. So everything that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are are all in Christ. And when we step inside the circle, we begin to see the Father. The Spirit begins to move through us. And the Son, the Son begins to mold and shape us into his image. And the fullness is in Christ, and through him... Let me let me get the, the sense here of the verse. Um, uh, 
so that in all things he may become supreme. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to him or all things for him. So you have the fullness is in Christ. Reconciliation is accomplished through Christ and the fullness and the reconciliation are for Christ. Now, when, when we look at these, this faith, hope, and love, we stand in Christ for hope. We move through Christ, or Christ moves through us for power. And then for Christ, we do the deeds of the gospel, the deeds of justice, the deeds of love. Now, all of this takes place. He's reconciling all things to himself or for himself by making peace through the blood of his cross. Now, the word reconcile means to be restored to an original place of harmony and relationship. In the beginning, God set forth a purpose for all creation, for all time for all of the heavens and the earth and those things under the earth, the Lord set in motion a plan and a purpose. It was disrupted by sin. Jesus comes and through the blood of his cross, he establishes peace. He establishes shalom. He establishes relationship, relationships that were broken. He establishes a reconciliation between God and man, between God and creation, and thereby between man and man. We don't start off with human reconciliation. We start off with divine reconciliation. As the Lord reconciles us to him, and we look around and see his works and his deeds as he begins to reconcile creation to himself. And that's creation is, 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 is all kinds of purposes socioeconomic purposes, political purposes, spiritual purposes, educational purposes. The Lord wants to establish and release blessing in all of these areas of, of, of human life. But as we are reconciled to him and we begin to see his work to reconcile creation to himself, we find ourselves being reconciled to each other. And, and this, this tension that stops us from being reconciled to each other in the church, in the body of Christ, hinders the vision and the mission, the apostolic vision and the apostolic mission. We continue in verse 20, through him, whether things on the earth or things in the heavens, the Lord is reconciling all things to himself. Verse 21 then continues, and you were once alienated and hostile in your minds. To be alienated means you're shut out from relational fellowship and intimacy. And alienation is a breaking of intimate relationships. We were alienated from God and that causes us to be alienated from creation and causes us to be alienated from each other. And we were hostile in our minds and it says in wicked works, not by wicked works, in the realm of wicked works, there's the circle we lived in. In the realm of wicked works, our minds are influenced to turn against God, God's creation, our, our fellow human beings to turn against God's purposes. Yet now, and now we're going to see this beginning of several words now that Paul says, yet now we have been reconciled in the body of his flesh through death in order to present us holy, without blemish, and blameless before him. Now, I want you to understand what's taking place here. Everything that Jesus has done for us, and, and Paul started out with the church and some of the things the church needs, and then he's into Jesus, starting in verse uh, 14 onward or maybe even verse 12 onward, it's this incredible work in Jesus. Jesus is the source of all of this. And this incredible work that has started in Jesus deals with three realms. Holy is the theological realm. Without blemish is the liturgical realm. 
and blameless is the ethical realm. The Lord's work, first of all, makes us holy. That's the theological realm. What he is, we become. We don't try to become what he is. What he is, we become. Because he lives, we live also. That's the theological realm. Holiness. We get in Christ and we're set apart from the world and set apart to God to become everything that God is in Jesus Christ. And everything that Jesus is, we are. Not we need to become. We have it. We are. When we step in the circle, we have it. When you step outside the circle, you don't. When somebody steps outside the circle, don't tell them to get, they need to get saved. They already are saved. Tell them to get back in the circle to live out your existence. We have a, a, a bipolar, schizophrenic kind of existence because we go in and out of the circle. But when you're in the circle, you're in Christ. And everything that God has done in Christ is ours now. Second, we're without blemish. Without blemish means then that, that God, what the Lord does is he imputes his righteousness to us. He says, remember, God only accepted perfect animals to be sacrificed, not, not imperfect. If there was any flaw and blemish, they, they, they weren't accepted. We become that in Christ because of his work. That's the liturgical realm, the religious realm. It's the imputation of his righteousness. He says, you're in Christ. Everything that's true about Christ is true about you. Stay in Christ in hope and faith and in love. The third, though, is blameless. That's the ethical realm. Our life, because of what Christ has done for us, and the seed of the gospel is sown as it begins to what? We talked about increasing and growing and producing fruit our lives become conformed to the image of Christ. And all of this happens, verse 23 says, if indeed you continue in the faith, having been founded and firmed and not shifting away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. We've already read these verses. Which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a servant. Now I've got about 15 minutes, and I want to share the remainder of the chapter. So Paul has spoken about the church and what the church needs. He's spoken about the only way the church can get it is through Jesus. Now he's going to address leaders. He's going to address those apostolic, prophetic, pastoral, teaching, evangelistic leaders in the body of Christ. I'm addressing my leaders and I'm addressing all future leaders in the body of Christ. Here's another now. And I, these nows coincide. Now... Verse 21 says, he's reconciled us in the body of his flesh through death. Now that's happened. And he says, because of that, I'm an apostle, I'm a bond servant, and I'm a minister of the gospel. And now I rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf. And I fill up the things that are lacking in the afflictions of the Messiah, in the afflictions of Christ. Now, this is where we get to what we're talking about as being the, the apostolic imperative. And it, it may take me another week to flesh this out, but let's at least establish the basis here. How does a leader disciple his people? How does a leader bring people into the vision and mission of the church and of the kingdom, which is what Paul's been talking about in the first 23 verses. Well, we talked about the leader has to start with his relationship with the Lord. Thanksgiving to God, our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks. A thankful heart. Second, we said he prays. And he prays and he prays some more. He prays for the people of God. Third, what's been spoken is he proclaims the gospel. He proclaims who Jesus is. He proclaims who the Father is. He proclaims the basis of hope and faith and love. He proclaims what God has accomplished in Christ Jesus. Proclamation after proclamation after proclamation. So, how does a leader disciple his people and bring them into the vision and the mission of the Lord? 
thanks, thanksgiving, prayer, proclamation, and suffering. I now rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf. I now rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And it is through my sufferings for you, I fill up what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ. And then he says, in my flesh, for the sake of his body, which is the church. And he repeats again, of which I became a servant. He spoke of being a servant in verse 23, and now he's defining what it really means to be a servant minister. You suffer for the church. You suffer because the rest of the church is not able to suffer. And by suffering, now, now we all experience trauma and difficulty, but w- what the Bible means by suffering, Paul has already said, the Lord has, uh, God the Father has qualified us to share uh, in the inheritance of the saints in light. In verse 12, verse 13, he rescued us from the dominion of authority and darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And then in the f- verse before that, we are empowered for perseverance and long-suffering. See, suffering, biblical suffering, is not that horrible, terrible things happen to me. It's only biblical suffering when horrible, terrible things happen to you and you process those things biblically and you process those things Christologically and you process those things according to the will and the purposes of God. You see them as part of the will and the purposes of God. See, leaders suffer because the rest of the body is unable to suffer. When we talk about, well, why don't people pray more? Why aren't, why aren't people worshiping more? Why, why don't people understand the unity of the body of Christ? Why don't people come to church? Why don't people even avail themselves of the, the online teachings? Why, why, why do people get embittered toward other people and angry toward other people and treat other people poorly? The church does not have the ability to suffer. People who do that don't know what it means to suffer. And so now the leadership has to do what Jesus did. Remember the picture of the suffering servant, the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 42. You know, there there, there are four servant songs and we're actually doing that on the side at Lord of the Harvest as we're now reading Isaiah 40 through 66. Isaiah 42 is one of the, Isaiah 42, one through nine is the first servant song. Isaiah 52 and 53 are the final servant song. Isaiah 52, I think it's 52, 12 through 53, the end of the chapter. And Isaiah 53 talks about the Lord, he took upon himself our weaknesses. He took upon himself our sin. He bore our infirmities in his body. See, that's the apostolic imperative. Jesus bore and carried through on his own back as the servant of the Lord. Who's the servant of the Lord? Paul says, I became a servant in verse 23. And he says that he is a servant in verse 25. He's saying, just like Isaiah 42 was for Jesus, and just like Isaiah 53 was for Jesus, that's what it is for me now. See, we there's there's this 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 term that was used in the Old Testament. It talked about the afflictions of the Messiah, the tribulation of the Messiah. Messiah would come and he would bear suffering and sorrow according to Psalm 22, according to Isaiah 52 and 53. And these afflictions of the Messiah, that's what Paul's getting at. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and I fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. See, Christ suffered and bore our weaknesses and bore our infirmities in order to release redemption, in order to release eternal life, in order to release the power of God, in order to release righteousness and peace and joy, in order to manifest the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Lord. That's what Jesus did. And suffering, the cross is a picture of that suffering is what releases 
the life of the Lord. Now see, the church participates in Jesus' mission after he's gone to heaven. Now we become the saints of the Most High. Now the, the passage in, in Daniel, Daniel 7, 21 through 27, you know, in Daniel 7, the Son of Man receives a kingdom. And then that Son of Man passes the kingdom on to who? The saints of the Most High. Oh, aren't you talking about the saints? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints at Colossae? Oh, yes, you said give thanks to the Father in verse 12, having qualified us for our share of the inheritance of the saints. What's our share? It's our portion. Well, the kingdom is given to the Son of Man in Daniel 7, and the Son of Man gives that kingdom to the saints of the Most High. And of course, the saints of the Most High experience warfare and tribulation and suffering when the Son of Man gives them the kingdom. Jesus set the kingdom in purpose, uh, the kingdom purpose in motion, and the church's job is to fulfill the work of the kingdom. How will we fulfill the work in the kingdom? We become those who bear the sins and the infirmities of others. Now, we don't bear the sin and the infirmity of others in the same way Jesus did. Jesus, it's redemptive. It's Jesus, it's, it's for eternal salvation. But we, as his servants, just as Paul is an apostle by the will of God, and then he prays for the saints in Colossae to have a revelation of the will of God, just as the will of God moves through Paul as a minister, as a servant of the gospel, the will of the Lord is to move through God's people, there to have a full knowledge of God's will, and then we're all being equipped for the apostolic mission of the church. Now, we go forth like Jesus, and leaders, we thank God, we pray for God's people, we proclaim the truth to them, and we suffer. And suffering brings impartation. See, Jesus' work isn't completed until he dies and he's raised from the dead. Suffering is the key component for impartation. Suffering creates impartation. Lord, why is this going on in my life? You're suffering in your own body. But you're suffering with perseverance and long-suffering. You have a Christological view to suffering and you're bearing the sins and the infirmities of other and others and continuing to immerse them in the steadfast love of the Lord, continuing to immerse them in grace and truth, continuing to point them to the truth of the gospel. And it is through suffering that you begin to impart that apostolic wisdom that people need to have the strength to walk in the fullness of the gospel. I can see we'll, we'll, we'll need one more week for this because I can't do justice to this. But, but I, I really want our people to get a picture here. Verse 24, and I'll repeat again, I now rejoice. Remember what was spoken earlier? Verse 11, the Lord empowers us with all power in the might of his glory that we might endure, suffer long with joy. He empowers us to suffer, but he empowers us to suffer with joy. He empowers us to suffer with a joy that as you endure and you suffer Christologically, you suffer for the purposes of God, then you can impart joy, endurance, and long-suffering to those whom the Lord puts under you. On Friday, we had, a, we had a, um, a leadership team meeting, a Zoom meeting, Lord of the Harvest. And the one thing I really found in letting, Jan and I found in, in letting all the, the leaders of the rest of the leaders of the church discuss how they're feeling, what they're seeing, a heaviness, a sorrow, a weight that was on them. It was just so, so heavy. And I said something, I wasn't making a flippant remark. And my wife said something. You're coming to understand what real apostolic leadership is. 
because you are now learning to suffer for the sake of the church. But Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering. See, the, endurance and perseverance, long-suffering, without joy, without grace, without eucharisto, without good gifts from the Lord, without the good news from the Lord, without forgiveness, cancellation of debt, restoration of inheritance, freedom from slavery. That's what gives us the strength to rejoice in our sufferings for the sake of the church. And then we fill up. You know what it means to fill up? We impart to the church what it's lacking in terms of discipleship, in terms of vision, in terms of mission. We impart. I taught this many years ago, Camp Garner Creek, and the way the Lord showed me the message at that point is what what the apostolic imperative is, what Colossians 1.24 is, is that Jesus is the ladder between heaven and earth. And as leaders, when, when, when we're in the, in the earth trying to minister to people, trying to disciple people, trying to bring them in to the vision and try to bring them into the, the, the mission of the Lord and, and trying to, to establish faithfulness, walking worthy of the gospel, all these things that Paul talked about when we're trying to get revelation to God's people for them to, to understand God's will, to understand who God is, to see the Father as the Father. When we're doing that, we're on earth and we can't get, we, we don't have any of those things inside ourselves. We climb the ladder to heaven ourselves in our thanksgiving, in our prayer, in our own study. We climb the ladder. We get what we need from heaven. We climb down the ladder and we give it to God's people. See, that's what Paul's talking about here. In other words, we step into Christ and we impart the vision for others to step into Christ as well. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ. I impart what the church is lacking so that they can now be part of the afflictions of Christ. They can, like Christ, be the saints of the Most High who help fulfill God's purposes in the earth. But leaders have to impart those things to those who don't have it. Now we can rebuke people for not having it. We can judge people for not having it. We can be harsh with people for not having it. We can condemn people for not having it. Or we can go get it ourselves and give it to them. When Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you and I impart the things that are lacking of the afflictions of Christ, he says, it's in my flesh for the sake of his body, which is the church. What did Paul mean it's in his flesh? Well, what was going on in Colossians right now? Paul was in prison. He was in prison for the sake of the gospel. He was a prisoner of faith. And so, but he understood his sufferings Christologically. He understood, I'm in prison so that you might get set free. I'm suffering so that you might learn how to suffer and set other people free. And so this participation in the suffering of Christ, the suffering of Christ is the eschatological key for the Lord establishing his purposes in the earth. And I'll close. We didn't finish the rest of these verses. I, I, I still had too much backup work to do. Uh, we needed two weeks on Colossians 1, the first 23 verses, to show you that it's all about Christ and it's in Christ and it's through Christ and it's for Christ. And we just step inside the circle and, and, and help other people. We impart spiritual wisdom and understanding for other people to step inside the circle. But he says, he concludes, which is his body, which is the church, verse 25, of which I became a minister, a ministering servant, according to the stewardship of God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. That word 
the word of God that he's fulfilling, it goes back to verse 5, the hope laid up for us in heavens of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Paul is fulfilling the word. There's an eschatological dimension to the word. The word says, here's my purposes. Here's why my purposes are my purposes. And here's how my purposes are going to be established. And that's the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel is to fulfill the word of God. And Paul says, through the apostolic imperative as a leader in the body of Christ, I will help fulfill that word. We will, I was hoping we'd finish 24 through 29. We just scratched the surface 24 through 29. We'll do 24 through 29 next week. Thank you, Lord. I pray that your people are encouraged as they're listening to the word of God. Uh, I pray, Father, that, that this word will go forth and that the apostolic mission and apostolic vision that is in the church will become an apostolic imperative that will cause people to be discipled and to become part of the fulfillment of the word of God in the earth by knowing the Father, by being devoted to the Son, and by having the power of the Spirit manifested through us in Christ, in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.